Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the 2018 Informa Farmer Intelligence Farmer R&D Annual Review Webinar. My name is Ian Lloyd, and I am the Senior Director for Pharma Projects, our drug pipeline database, which has been collecting comprehensive data on new pharmaceuticals since 1980. From the early 90s, I've been analyzing data from the current pipeline and seeing how it has changed over the previous 12 months, to see how the industry is evolving and to identify trends as they emerge. My 2018 report is available as a free download from our website, and this webinar is based on its findings. I'm joined today by my colleague, Alex Shimming. So Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Ian. Hi, my name is Alex Shimmings. I'm the executive editor for Script, Pink Sheet, and In Vivo. I've been writing about the pharmaceutical industry for the last 20 years, uh, mainly on Script, and I focus on R&D. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, and all attendees will be sent a link to the recording and slides after the event. We do encourage you to post questions during the presentation, and we'll try to answer some of these at the end of the webinar. However, if we don't get time to answer yours, don't worry, we'll follow up with, a, with an email over the next few days. Right, let's get started and take a look at today's agenda. So we're going to start off by looking at what you might style as the headline figure, the total number of drugs in the R&D pipeline for 2018. By R&D pipeline, throughout this presentation, we mean drugs which are in active development by commercial organizations for human ethical use, all the way from preclinical studies through the various phases of clinical development, the registrational phases, and also it does include some launch drugs. We include launch drugs that are still being in the pipeline if they are still being developed for additional diseases or for additional countries. Before we actually break down the pipeline um, into several uh, different analyses, we'll step back and take a look at the new active substances which successfully uh, made it onto the market during 2017. Then we'll be looking at the pipeline in detail, slicing and dicing it by various different metrics and seeing how things are changing. And finally, we'll take a few minutes to have a look at what you can expect in drug R&D in the year ahead. And as I mentioned, hopefully at the end we'll have some time for Q&A. So let's start off with the total pipeline size in 2018. And here we have the headline figure. So what you see here is the total number of drugs in the pipeline for every year, uh, usually January, um, the, the time point is taken uh, from 2001 up through to 2018. And you can see that generally there's been an increase year on year. The headline figure this year is 15,267. This is a 2.7% increase on last year's figure. However, that's a smaller increase than we saw in the previous year. So in the 2016 to 2017 rate of increase was 8.4%, so considerably higher. Now, during the past 12 months, 3,807 drugs entered the Pharma Projects database onto the, the pipeline. Um, but we've seen a net increase of just 395 drugs. So this indicates that a net of 3,412 drugs left development during the past year too, which means overall in the pipeline there was a churn rate of 20%, which is pretty significant. Uh, growth has picked up uh, again for 2018 in some indications, and we'll look at that in more detail later. But it's important to note before we go any further that growth in the size of the pipeline is not necessarily a good thing. As I mentioned before, most of the drugs we're talking about are not generating any revenue yet. So a, a bigger pipeline generally means a bigger cost. It's only a good thing if it's matched by an increasing number of new drugs uh, hitting the market. So now I'm going to hand over to Alex, and she's going to take a look at the number of new active substances which were launched during 2017. Alex. Thanks, Ian. Okay, so in this section, we're going to take a look at how 2017's tally of new active substance launches compares with Pharma's efforts in previous years. Then we're going to look at which companies managed the most first launches, what were the most common therapy areas for the new drugs, and then we'll look at which markets were the most popular in which to make a debut. 
And then finally, we're going to take a closer look at the drugs launched in 2017 that have novel mechanisms of action. Now, this slide shows the number of new active substance launches by year since 2000. In pink at the top of each column, you can see the vaccine separated out. Now, just to be clear, when we talk about a new active substance, we mean a new chemical or biological entity where the active ingredient has received no prior approval for human use. So we include vaccines with novel antigenic components, but we exclude reformulations, generics or biosimilars. As you can see, the figures show that 2017 was the second best year since the start of the century, with 54 NAS launches. These are broken down into 47 new chemical or biological entities, and then a further seven vaccines. Altogether, you can see that the second decade of the century so far has shown a significant improvement on the first in terms of numbers of new drugs launching. In the first decade, there was an average of just 32 NAS launches each year, but the mean from 20 to 2017 is now up to just over 46. So to recap on the main points of the number of NAS launches so far, specifically, there was a 32% increase in the number of NAS launches last year over 2016. But what's more is that there was an increase in the number of products that were first in class. That is, at the first time, a drug with a particular mechanism of action has hit the market. In 2017, there were 14 novel NASs. That's up from, from nine in 2016. And in the next slide, we're going to take a look at some of these, plus a number of the other more interesting NASs from 2017. Overall, we found that 2017 was a vintage year for novelty and it really produced some notable firsts. It saw the arrival of the first CAR T therapies, plus other new, interesting new therapies in cancer and for infections and inflammation. So to start, we have highlighted the first chimeric antigen, antigen receptor T cell, or CAR T therapies, and they were Novartis' Kimraya and Gilead's Yescarta. Now, CAR T is effectively an ex vivo gene therapy. In it, T cells are removed from the patient's body and genetically modified to express a uh, chimeric antigen receptor. And that programs the cells to target antigens expressed on the surface of the tumor. Now, both these products, these first two CAR T products, use this approach to engineer a patient's own cells to target the CD19 molecule, and that's expressed on a variety of different tumors. Strictly speaking, um, targeting CD19 is not novel in that Amgen got there first with the first monoclonal antibody to target that protein, which was Blincyto in 2014. But we felt that the novelty of the CAR-T approach meant that we really should include them here. The next notable first that we've highlighted was the approval of Spark Therapeutics Gene Therapy Lux Turner, and that's for RPE65 mutation associated retinal dystrophy. Now, this didn't, strictly speaking, reach the market last year. It was approved. But again, it was the first US approval for a gene therapy, so we felt it warranted a mention, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Next, we have the first systemic therapy for atopic dermatitis with Dupixent from um, Sanofi and Regeneron that was launched in the US and approved in the EU and Japan. And there were two further immuno-oncology drugs that were notable, the PDL1 inhibitors Infinity from AstraZeneca and Preventio from Merck and Pfizer and they're adding to the number of um, checkpoint inhibitors that are now on the market. And FINSI was approved in the US for urothelial cancer and Bevencia for urothelial and Merkel cell carcinoma. And then finally on this slide, we've highlighted a couple of very successful launches from 2017. First, we've got GSK's Shingrix vaccine, the shingles, and then Roche's multiple sclerosis therapy, Oprivus. So Shingrix cleared a big hurdle recently in the US when the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommended Shingrix over its rival shingles vaccine, Zostavax, which is from Merck & Co. And that was based on its efficacy, and it means that the product is poised to become a blockbuster. But really, it's been outshone by Ocrevus, which was the first product to get a specific approval for primary progressive MS and got off to a real flying start on the market with one of the most successful launches ever seen. It's, um, 
well on its way to being a blockbuster. I think in its first um, nine months, it was nearly a blockbuster within the first nine months on the market, and that's outpaced a whole load of notable launches in the last six years, including Pfizer's Ibrant, Novartis's Cosentix, as well as Bristol My Squibb's IO Pioneer Opdivo. So this table, we're looking at the top companies by number of NAS launches last year. And you can see that 2017 was a better year for the big pharma companies as well. In 2016, six of the top ten companies failed to deliver any novel drugs to market, but last year, each firm that launched at least one NAS. If you look at this table, you can see that Novartis tops the league with four, including Kim Raya. Four other top ten companies managed three launches apiece, and those were AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Merck & Co, and Sanofi. Of the four further companies which launched more than one NAS, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals stands out because it has the best NAS launch to pipeline size ratio. Regeneron ranks down at number 75 in terms of its R&D portfolio size, but the number of launches means it's punching well above its weight. Both of its launches came via its long-standing relationship with Sanofi, but this is now being wound down. Next, looking at NASs by their therapeutic area of their launched indication. And this donut chart shows that cancer's preeminence in red. You can see that oncology products led the way in 2017 with 17 NAS launches. That's 31% of the total, and it matches the proportion of the um, development pipeline that cancer now um, occupies. Anti-infectives came in a close second in the turquoise with 16 NAS launches. And even if we discount the seven vaccines, this is a really good result. But it is mainly down to antiviral introductions. We're not seeing um, any of the much-needed new antibacterial products reaching the market. Neurologicals, which is the second largest therapeutic area by size, had a poor year in contrast. Just had three launches in multiple sclerosis, pain, and tardive dyskinesia. And there were no advances for the really intractable conditions like Alzheimer's. Cardiovascular, as you can see, fared even worse with not even a single NAS launch in that therapeutic area. But there was one in the related blood and clotting field for Hem Libra, about which more later. Now, this chart shows the NAS launches in 27 by region. As you can see, the lion's share of the number of NAS launches were made in the U.S. with 34, and that's 63%. And this changes little from year to year. The U.S. is always the dominant market here. And that also might reflect the fact that the U.S. FDA had a particularly good year last year in terms of drug approvals with a 21-year high and 46 approvals. The next most popular NAS launching pad was Japan, with four, and there were a smattering of first launches in Europe. Now we're going to have a look at some of the other first-in-class products um, that reached the market last year. First up, we have the cell and gene therapies, and there there was Holoclar from Holostem and Chiesi. This is an autologous corneal epithelial cell transplant therapy. It's a whole cell transplant, and so it consists of cells expanded ex vivo. So it doesn't have a specific mechanism of action as such, but we feel that it counts as novel. It is an, um, you know, it's definitely different, and it's been given a go-ahead in the EU for, for, these, for these burns. Next, we have tissue gene and colons ex vivo gene therapy in VOSA. And that's a novel approach, both because of it, the way it's delivered and its mechanism of action. It consists of primary chondrocytes infected with a retroviral vector expressing the transforming growth factor beta 1. And these are injected into the patient's joints. The technique using local delivery means it's better, it has better half-life and side effects profile than systemically administered TGS beta. This product was launched in South Korea for osteoarthritis of the knee. More novelty in cancer, we have Puma Biotechnologies Neuralynx, which is approved for adult breast cancer patients with HER2 overexpressed disease. Now, what makes this agent novel is that as well as targeting the ERB B2 tyrosine kinase, it also hits the ERB B4 kinase, or HER4. 
and we have BioCrisp Pharmaceuticals and Mundi Pharma. They delivered the first purine nucleoside phosphorylase inhibitor in the form of Sodocene. This drug is indicated for relaxed or refractory peripheral T cell lymphoma and was one of the Japanese NAS launches. In anti-infectives, we actually saw some novelty outside the HIV or hepatitis C areas, which made a nice change. We have Acurus and Merkin Co's Prevamis, and this is the first example of the cytomegalovirus terminase inhibitor, and it was launched in the US at year end for prophylactic use in adult CMV seropositive recipients of an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Then in Japan, we've got Mahuro's Amenalif. This was introduced for varicella zoster virus infection, or shingles. It's a DNA helicase inhibitor, and it contributes to what was a banner year for shingles, together with GSK's vaccine Shingrix. And then lastly, we were, another welcome product was Implava for the treatment of C. diff infections. This isn't an antibiotic as such. It's a monoclonal antibody that's specific for C. diff toxin B. Its U.S. launch in February was quickly followed by EU launches and a Japanese approval later in the year. So moving on to the respiratory segments, we have the first interleukin-5 receptor antagonist, as opposed to previously launched direct interleukin-5 antagonist, and that's Fasemra from AstraZeneca, and that's indicated for severe asthma in patients 12 years or older with an eosinophilic phenotype. It was launched in the U.S. in November. And then we have the, uh, an antibody product, which is a, a change in hemophilia. They're more normally treated by recombinant proteins, but Hemlibra from um, Roche is an asymmetric by specific IgG antibody to factor 9A and factor 10. And then together it mimics the factor 8 cofactor function. This means it can be used to prevent or reduce the frequency of bleeding episodes in patients with hemophilia A and factor 8 inhibitors. And that's the first time we've seen a factor 9A inhibition as a mechanism in an approved drug. And finally, we've got two new enzyme replacement therapies, which count as first in class. That's Biomarin Pharmaceuticals Brunura and Ultragenics' Metsevii. And now I'm going to hand you back to Ian, who's going to look at the pipeline in more detail. Thanks, Alex. So we've seen it's a pretty successful year in terms of drug launches, and we've seen that the overall pipeline size is continue, continuing to expand, albeit at a slower rate. What we're going to do now is look at that pipeline and slice it and dice it in a number of different ways to see if we can ascertain trends within R&D. So let's start by looking at the, the global status of all of those 15,000 plus drugs in the pipeline. So here we have them broken down by the most advanced stage which they've reached, with the purple bars showing the 2017 figure and the pink bars the 2018 number. So what you can see is um, the preclinical stage um, grew by quite a lot, 7.3% fueled um, in no small part by those 3,807 drugs I mentioned were added to our database during the year. At the other end of the development cycle, you can see the launch number fell by around 200, despite the fact that there were 100 new launches during the year. So this reflects the fact that 300 of the, those launch drugs in the active pipeline were removed from that because they became fully launched during the year. So they were no longer in development for further indications or for additional countries. So this kind of cleaning up at this end of the pipeline probably significantly contributed to the depression in the expansion rate in the pipeline this year. But I think what's more interesting is to look at those, the stages in between. So let's look at the clinical phases and let's look at those going back a few more years. Now, as Foreign Projects is uh, integrated with our other database product, Trial Trove, which looks at uh, individual trial protocols, we can be extremely confident of the robustness of our data at the clinical stages. So you can see here that phase one has been increasing year on year, uh, and last year, it, uh, uh, over the past 12 months, it increased by 3.0%. However, phase two is pretty flat, and for the first time for a long while, there's been an actual decline in the number of drugs at the phase three stage of 1.9%. So if quantity is flat, what about quality? Quality is obviously something that's somewhat more subjective, but one of our other database products, Biomed Tracker, the analysts there review uh, late-stage drugs 
and make adjustments to their likelihood of approval based on certain milestones, such as rep reports from clinical trial results or gaining expedited approvals, that, that kind of thing. So what you can see here is for phase two, phase three, pre-registration, and at the bottom, uh, the combined figures, the purple bar shows drugs which have uh, a greater than average chance of being approved at that stage. The pink bar, those which have an average chance, and the yellow bar, those which have a below average chance. So while the data hasn't really changed much year on year for pre-registration, a greater percentage have an above average chance of approval, 52.5% versus 49.3%. However, the same could be said for those drugs judged to have a less than average chance of approval. The trend, that trend is reversed for drugs in phase three. Overall, really, though, the, the figures are strikingly similar over the 12-month period, and this is a metric that we probably need to be tracking over a longer period to make any kind of judgment. Let's move on now to a look at the leading companies by size of pipeline, and here we have the top 10 pharma companies by pipeline size. Uh, on the right-hand column, you can see the number of drugs which each company originated, and in the column to the left, you can see the total number of drugs in its pipeline with the corresponding 2017 figure. So the column to the left includes drugs which companies have also licensed in, as well as those which they've originated. So we can see that Novartis remains at the summit, um, top of the pops. Uh, it has 28 fewer drugs in its pipeline than it did this time last year, though. Conversely, the runner-up at uh, number two, Johnson & Johnson, has climbed, but it's fair to say this is largely due to the fact that during the course of 2017, it completed an acquisition, a fairly sizable acquisition, that of Actelion. And what's striking, I think, is that only two of the top ten increased their pipeline size, the other one being Takeda. The other thing to notice is the top ten uh, has the same uh, population as last year. It's the same companies. So this is interesting, I think, in two ways. Uh, one, because in the noughties, that was rarely the case. During the, the last period of mega merger mania, there was a huge shuffling around and change in the, in the, in the pers pers uh, personas dramata of the uh, companies in the top 10. Um, but over the last few years, it hasn't really changed terribly much. Um, those of you who are following the news will, of course, note that We've already had one pretty sizable merger announced this year with Takeda poised to acquire Shire. So whether this is the start of a new era of uh, merger mania, we'll have to wait and see. So we, we mentioned earlier on, Alex mentioned that the top 10 pharma companies had a good year last year. So what I've done here is just replace that final column to the right with a number of new active substance launches each drug produced. So, as Alex mentioned, last year, six of the top ten failed to produce a single new active substance launch, whereas we can see last year every single one did, with Novartis, the company with the biggest pipeline. I'm sorry, I didn't advance the slide. There we go. Um, so, Novartis, the, uh, co the company with the biggest pipeline, also having the biggest number of new active substance launches. So, I think that's really good news. I think the situation we saw last year of the 10 companies with the biggest pipeline, only four delivering a drug, that is not sustainable. So I think there were a lot of collective sighs of relief around the industry this year. What about the total number of companies involved in pharma R&D? So here you can see the total number of companies which are currently developing drugs towards the, the right, uh, currently at 4,134. So this grew up by 3.3%, but as with the pipeline size figure, it's a smaller increase than we saw in the previous year. In fact, during the course of the year, we added 618 new companies to the database. So there were 618 companies identified as having pharma R&D for the first time. So this means, again, there is a net figure for dropping out as well, which must be 487. So once again, what we're seeing is a huge amount of churn in the pharma industry. Lots of companies entering R&D, lots of companies exiting R&D, either through being acquired or becoming dormant or maybe even going, going bust. So I think what's really interesting to look at is see how the, the balance of R&D across different kinds of companies is changing in the industry. 
But what you see here with the pink line is the percentage of the entire pipeline which the top 10 pharma companies have contributed each year. So what we can see is in 2011, 13% of the pipeline came from the top 10 pharma companies, whereas by 2018, this is around 7%. That's a pretty significant shift. And if we look at the uh, purple, uh, sorry, the gray line, that's the same figure for the top 25 companies. So the same thing is being seen. The top 25 companies uh, accounted for nearly 19% of the pipeline uh, seven years ago, and now it has fallen to around 13, just over 12%. Meanwhile, the uh, percentage of the pipeline which is being delivered by the smallest companies with just one or two drugs has been on the increase. In 2011, this was 15%, and in, nine, uh, in 2018, this has gone up to 19%. So this gives an indication of a slightly changing shift in the, in the pipeline overall, where the big companies are actually contributing fewer of the drugs, but we're getting an increasingly long tail of new companies. As we mentioned, there's a lot of new companies appearing, so it kind of indicates there's quite a lot of venture capital around, and also, the fact that the number of small companies is still increasing, despite the fact that they're, they're being acquired by large companies, again, I think indicates a healthy environment. So where are these companies operating? This, these two uh, graphics give us the headquarter countries for, each, uh, for all of the, the companies in the pipeline in 2017 to the left, 2018 to the right. So no surprise at all, I think, to see the US is by far the, the largest country for company headquarters, and it, in fact accounts for almost half of the companies worldwide. Uh, over the course of the past year, that it actually uh, gained a, an extra percentage, uh, up from 47 to 48%. China also increased its share by 1%, but that's on the back of a, a smaller share to start with, so it's more significant. Uh, Europe saw a decline of 1%, uh, as did Canada. So far, the UK looks to be holding steady in its share of the, the pharma companies, no change year on year, which is interesting in the context of the uh, forthcoming uh, Brexit. doesn't look like so far UK-based uh, pharma companies are seeking to relocate as the UK leads the EU. We're now going to move away from companies and look at the kinds of drugs in the pipeline. So here we have the pipeline by the broad therapeutic areas, starting with the anti-cancer to the left, going all the way down to the smallest anti-parasitic to the right. Once again, the purple gives you the 2017 figure and the pink 2018. Uh, it's worth noting here that there is uh, some double counting in that if a drug is in development for uh, diseases in more than one therapeutic area, it will be counted under, under both of them or, or however many it's in development for. Um, with a smaller overall pipeline increase this year, it's, it's actually more interesting to see, rather than everything going up, this graph actually ha has some therapeutic areas going up and other ones going down, which is some, not something we've seen in uh, recent years. Cancer, in fact, has grown by 7.6%. And if you remember, the total pipeline expansion rate was 2.8%. That's almost three times the average. Contrast that with anti-infectives, and they were actually down by 9.3%, which is a pretty large chunk. Uh, cardiovascular also declined, down 7.2%. Uh, neurologicals, one of the, 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 the largest um, therapeutic areas, was about average at 2.4%. So this really is something that's been happening for a while. Cancer has been taking an ever bigger slice of the R&D pie. If you look back to the, the 2010 on this graph, you'll see that cancer, uh, cancer, cancer accounted for around one in four of all drugs. So one in four, a quarter of all drugs were in development for at least one oncological indication. And by now, it's risen to 34.1%. So now more than a third of all drugs in R&D are being developed for cancer. So just think about that for a second. I think that's quite extraordinary. Uh, of all of the different diseases and therapeutic areas, one in three are being developed for cancer. Um, clearly, cancer is a disease with a huge unmet need and affects a lot of people, but one has to wonder whether this is starting to get a slightly disproportionate slice of the R&D budget. 
It's also interesting to look at the number of clinical trials by therapeutic area, and this is data from uh, uh, our uh, sister database, Trialcho, which I mentioned earlier on, covers clinical trials. So here, the, the, the difference is even more striking. Oncology, in fact, has three times as many ongoing trials than any other therapeutic area. Um, if you think about it, again, this, this kind of does make sense in that oncology drugs are often um, undergoing multiple trials um, for, for different cancer indications, and also oncology trials tend to be quite uh, long in duration, um, endpoint usually being uh, a pro progression-free survival or, or, or overall survival. Whereas uh, at the other end of the scale, something like an anti-infective, uh, you know, the trials are short. You take an antibacterial, your infection clears up within seven days or, or whatever, or it doesn't. So I think this is why you see such a huge pileup of uh, drugs in clinical trials for cancer. Let's zoom in a bit more now and look at individual t uh, indications or, or diseases. So here we can see the top 10 indications by pipeline size. And we've also highlighted the, the direction of travel, if you like, in the column to the right. So breast cancer uh, remains uh, top the, with the, the disease, which is the focus of the most R&D. And non-small lung, non cell lung cancer is the runner-up. Both of these diseases show double-digit increases percentage-wise from the previous year, with breast up 12.4% and non-small cell lung cancer up 12.1%. Ovarian cancer also shows double-digit growth, up 12.4%. And I think also what's striking to see is that seven of the top ten, and for the first time, all of the top five diseases are cancer indications. And if we look a little bit further down for the diseases from 11 to 25, 15 out of the top 25 are, are cancer diseases, every single one of which grew their pipeline sizes over the past year. The single biggest percentage increase was acute myelogenous leukemia, which is up 14.4%. So you have to ask, what is this coming at the expense of? And I think it's interesting to note in this table that three of the diseases which are actually falling down are all autoimmune or inflammation-related diseases, namely rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and asthma. We can also look at the mechanisms of action or pharmacologies which drugs uh, have. Um, it's worth noting at the start that in pharma projects we use a hierarchical mechanism of action classification. This does tend to mean that the broader categories at the top of the classification are overrepresented, since often when we first identify drugs in the early stages, their precise mechanism of action is either not known or is not disclosed. Uh, so, hence, you see the very, very broad category immunostimulant at the top. But I think the one below it is the more interesting one. So, anti-cancer immunotherapy is the one that we use for the immuno-oncology category, which, as everyone knows, is extremely hot at the moment. And you can see that the number of drugs in development for immuno-oncology increased by 50% um, in the past year. Uh, compared to 123% the previous year. Overall, the numbers of increases are about the same, 443 up uh, this year, 490 before. And yet, if you look at the column to the right-hand side, this shows you the percentage of compounds for each mechanism um, which have reached the latest stages of development, so either in pre-registration, uh, having been approved, or launched. So you can see at the moment, only 1.6% of that huge number, 1332 immuno-oncology drugs, have actually reached those later stages. So in that sense, it's a hugely high-risk strategy still. Um, so we'll have to really watch and see how things progress over the next few years. Clearly, everyone thinks there's huge promise in this, in this uh, kind of strategy, uh, but as yet, I think it's fair to add that note of caution that it's largely unproven yet. At number three, you'll see another new category we created uh, to catch um, kinds of, these kinds of drugs, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this is a subclass of immuno-oncology drugs and includes drugs which target molecules such as CD27, CD28, CD40, CD137, and OX40. In fact, the only top 10 mechanism not to have some kind of relationship to cancer is the opioid mu and, uh, agonist which is at number nine. 
We can also look at the individual drug protein targets. Uh, and here's a slightly different story. The, the mu1 opioid receptor is actually the, the top here. Uh, now, mu1 antagonists uh, are used in constipation, and mu1 agonists are used in pain relief. Um, but there are fewer cancer targets in the top 10, which I think really is uh, just highlighting the diversity of cancer targets which are in development. There's such a huge array of different uh, targets for cancer these days that they're, they're not packing the top 10 so much. And in fact, there are two non-cancer targets in the top five uh, which are falling, both of which are inflammation targets, uh, glucocorticoid receptor and tumor necrosis factor. So just those two in the top five are cancer targets. Uh, individual targets involved in immuno-oncology are starting to make it into the top 25 this year, though, with CD19 at number 15, program cell death 1, or PD1, at 17, and CD274, or PDL1, at number 18. How many new targets were identified during the year? This is always a really interesting metric to track because it gives you some sense of, if you like, the innovation index of the industry. So here you see the number of completely new uh, drug protein targets which we identified year by year. And by this measure, 2017 was a less than stellar year. Only 75 new targets were identified, so slightly lower than the more than 100 that were seen in both 2015 and 2016. But as you can see, this figure does ping around quite a lot. So I think it's difficult to say that the industry is becoming more or less innovative by this measure. Although one thing that's interesting is the total number of targets against which drugs are currently being developed did fall slightly uh, over the past 12 months, uh, from 1672 down to 1657. So we have a slightly less diverse pipeline now than we did last year. One definite trend that we've uh, been noticing over a long period is the move towards biologicals. So what you can see here is the pipeline split between the non-biotech drugs in pink and the biotech or biological drugs in purple. The shift to biotech is clearly continuing, although it only went up another 0.1% this year. It's now at 37.9%. So we're approaching the 40% mark where, where 4 in 10 drugs are biological drugs, which is actually more than double than what we saw 20 years ago. Um, but this may well plateau. Clearly, small molecules not only have a place in lots of diseases, they are generally more desirable for patients to take since biologicals are almost exclusively given by injectable or other invasive routes. Another trend we've noticed is the focusing increasingly on rare diseases. This year we saw 4,615 of our 15,000 plus drugs, or around 30% of the pipeline, are under de development for at least one officially classified rare disease. So therefore it's not surprising to see that author drug designations and expedited review designations being granted have also increased year on year. So let's sum up what we've, what we've found from our analysis of the 2018 pipeline. The pipeline is still growing, although the growth rate has slowed. 2017 was a very good year for new launches, and it had some notable firsts and innovative drugs, which is very encouraging. There were little change in the number of drugs at clinical stages, either in quantity or quality. And the top 10 pharma companies all delivered new drugs, but the share of the overall pipeline seems to be in a long-term decline. Cancer is now taking a third of all pipeline drugs and all of the top five indications. Meanwhile, the immuno-oncology boom is absolutely showing no sign of ending, despite the, the relative paucity of proven drugs. Biologicals are advancing towards 40% of the R&D portfolio, and companies are still focusing on rare diseases despite no evidence of increasing uh, innovation levels. So that's my summary of the pipeline for 2018 as it is. We're now going to get our crystal ball out slightly and Alex is going to talk about what to expect in the year ahead. Alex. Thank you. Yes, in this section we are going to, it's entitled what to expect in the year ahead, but obviously we're in May already, so a lot of this has already happened. So we're going to start off looking at the new drugs and clinical trials that have come through this year and that we're expecting 
at the end of this year. And then we're going to take a higher level look at the big themes that are affecting the industry just to round off. So here we start with selected drugs that were approved late last year and were um, launched early this year. At the top we have um, Luxterna again. This was launched in the US in the first quarter. And um, as it was a gene therapy, the company has come up with an innovative pricing model, which is based on outcomes that's been well received. The drug was actually priced at 850,000 US dollars, which was less than some commentators had expected. They thought maybe we might see the first million dollar drug. Um, so the whole pricing model has been, you know, as I said, very well received by um, observers in the industry. EU approval is expected in the third quarter, and outside the US, this product has been licensed to Novartis. Next, we have two products of type 2 diabetes, Deglatro and Azempic. These were both launched in the US earlier this year. Azempic's EU approval also came in Q1, and it's been filed in Japan. And finally, on this list, we have Airy Pharmaceuticals Repressa. That was launched in April in the US, and EU and Japan filings are due later this year. And here we have some of the more important improvals that have already happened. Um, it's been quite a, a brisk start to the year. Starting with other anti-HIV drugs, um, one of the notable ones has been Victecrevir from Gilead, and this is a component of its Victavi fixed-dose um, fix combination product. This one's standing out because this product's expected to help Gilead stabilize its overall HIV franchise. Um, that franchise is actually facing several patent expirations in the next five years, so this is a, an important product for Gilead. Another HIV drug, um, which is an interesting one, was Thera Technologies Trigazo. This is, differs because it's targeted at patients who no longer respond to conventional oral HIV therapies, so the multi-drug resistant patient. It's notable because it's not only the first HIV approval to carry a breakthrough therapy designation, but it's also the first of action to reach the market in HIV for 10 years. It also has a high annual list price of 118,000 US dollars, but the company says it expects to net about 30% less than that after rebates. So the product is actually a humanized monoclonal antibody that, unlike other antiretroviral agents, binds primarily to the second extracellular domain of the CD4 T cell receptor to prevent HIV from infecting CD4 cells but preserving the CD4 function. So it's novel in that respect. Next, we have Rigel, which has spent more than a decade developing Tavalise sorry, um, across multiple indications, and it will finally launch the spleen tyrosin canase, or SIC inhibitor, in late May, after its FDA approval last month for chronic immune thrombocytopenia in patients who've had an insufficient response to previous treatment. We've got no list price available yet, yet for that product, but the company believes that its value is largely rests on its novel mechanism of action and patient's duration of response. Next, we have Janssen's Erlida, which is the first therapy approved for non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. The US decision on this came about two months early, um, which is good for the company, but the drug might soon face stiff competition. The crowded, um, the prostate cancer market is very, very crowded, and it's particularly expected to get competition from Xtandi in this patient population. And then finally on this slide, the FDA approved Hildrakizumab as it alumnia for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And this is another highly um, competitive market. Now, this product is expected to become a major pillar for Sun as it tries to um, you know, boost its branded specialty drug business. The drug, um, Tildrakizumab, uh, differs because it binds to the P19 subunit of IL-23, and so it inhibits in its interaction with the IL-23 receptor that way to inhibit the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Again, as I said, it's a competitive market, and it's expected to go up against um, Johnson Johnson's first-in-class IL-23 blocker, which is Trempia. Now we're going to look at um, some improvals that haven't yet happened, which are expected later this year. First of all, um, 
What's notable about these, actually, though, is that uh, several of them have hit stumbling blocks already, which um, is raising a little bit more doubt about how speedily they're going to come to the market. But the most important category amongst these are the anti-CGRP monoclonals for migraine. Uh, CGRP is calcitonin gene-related peptide, and that's involved in the transmission of pain in the body. First of these expected is Amgen's Amovig. Uh, this is the only one of these um, products, these antibody products, that's fully human, and it's targeting the GCRP receptor as opposed to the ligand. Next, we have Teva's Fremonezumab. Its differentiating feature is it has the potential for quarterly dosing as opposed to monthly dosing for the competitors. Now, it has a June Purdue for date, but the company recently said that manufacturing issues could push its launch timeline back until the end of the year in what was quite a blow for Teva in this area. This means that Lilly might actually be able to leapfrog it with its product, Galkinezumab, which has a Purdue for date in October. Moving on, we've got Abbey's Elagolix, and this has been cited as a potential blockbuster, but um, it's the recent FDA review raised some liver data concerns, which has pushed back the user fee goal, goal date for endometriosis-associated pain. That decision is now slated for the third quarter of 2018. Um, it was due this month beforehand. The agency said it wants more time to review the additional implication regarding liver function tests. Then we have the recent um, AstraZeneca for moxitumumab. Um, this brings closer to market um, a key drug for AstraZeneca. It has a priority review date in September for a rare slow-growing slow leukemia. AstraZeneca has um, already highlighted this product as one of its accelerated back-to-growth candidates um, when Pascal Sorio came back um, tried to turn the company around five years ago under his plan. So it's quite a key product for that company. Um, the drug consists of the binding portion of an anti-CD22 antibody fused with a modified recombinant pseudomonas exotoxin. So the toxin inhibits the protein translation in the cells that have been targeted. And finally on this page, we have Lilly seeking US FDA approval for baricitinib for adults with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis who haven't responded well to methotrexate. Again, this is another one that's had a bit of disappointment. Members of the FDA's Arthritis Advisory Committee, um, they suggested in April that the JAK1-2 inhibitor's risk-benefit profile could limit its market, and they were concerned over thrombotic events with the product. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Next, we're going to look at some of the phase three results that uh, are due out in 2018. Some of these have already happened. And again, um, what's in common with some of them is that they've already um, left investors a little bit disappointed. In oncology, AstraZeneca, they now expect to have the overall survival data from their MYSTIC study in the second half of the year. They're still holding out hope that um, after it failed to show any benefit in progression-free survival, um, they will show an overall survival benefit. But unfortunately, there's been another study of the Derva-Tremi combination um, Arctic, and that failed to produce either a progression-free or an overall survival benefit when used um, late-stage treatment of advanced NSCLC. So that's casting more of a doubt over that domestic data. Then at the AACR, we had data from um, Bristol Myers Squibb's Checkmate 227 study of Updevo and Yervoy in NSCLC again. They were okay, but they were completely overshadowed by Merck and Co's Keytruder from the Keynote 189 study. And those results were deemed practice changing in that indication because um, of the OS, the overall survival benefit was seen that was much bigger than was expected. So Keytruder is really sweeping the board there. Unfortunately, though, there was another Keytruda study, Keytruda study that was less than impressive, and that was the ECHO301 trial, which combined it with the IDO inhibitor epicadostat, and that failed in metastatic melanoma, and it's throwing more doubt over the entire IDO inhibitor field. Moving on to neuroscience, uh, more disappointment. The first force of Israel's vascular biogenics, it had a phase three trial of the gene-based biological which failed in brain cancer, although the product is still being tested in ovarian cancer. 
then in Alzheimer's, um, disappointment for BTD's rage antagonist, and that failed in the steadfast phase three study and has now been discontinued. So the list of Alzheimer's failures keeps on growing, but Roche is still awaiting data for its amyloid targeting products like Cronergimab and Gantanerumab. Then we have the first two phase three studies of Johnson & Johnson's esketamine in treatment resistant depression, but they produce mixed data so far. Only one of them hit its primary endpoint. We should be getting data from several of the late stage trials for that product expected later this year. And then finally on this slide in the cardiometabolic area, data from the long-term study one of Asperion's vampedoic acid in hypercholesterolemia have raised concerns over its safety because there was an imbalance of deaths in the trial. Now, that means there are now doubts both over its competitive positioning and also the company's ability to file it for approval without cardiovascular outcomes data. Now we're going to look at the more overarching themes that are affecting the industry this year, just quickly to, to end with. Most of these are you know, things that have been affecting the industry for, for many years. We've got generic competition again, um, whether we can lift the US government will be able to lift barriers to generic competition. Uh, the ongoing problems of pricing and reimbursement, particularly for combination therapies. And then there's the uncertainty that's um, surrounding the whole Brexit negotiations and the e uh, with the UK leaving the EU. But looking at the technologies, there's some very interesting technologies that have quite disruptive potential for the industry, and we just highlighted a few of them here. Um, obviously, the personalized medicine and how that's going to change um, the way the patients are treated with genomic analysis and whether we can see improved response rates from that. Then there's been the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of the big companies are really looking into this to try and help um, with their R&D effectiveness, and Vartis for once recently talked about their digital health ambitions. And then we have the likes of Amazon and Google wanting to come into the industry and being acting as potential disruptors, um, particularly for delivery of drugs and drug distribution. And it's going to be interesting to see what kind of impact these companies have on the more staid pharma sector. And then finally, we just highlighted um, some of the M&A activity that we've already seen this year. M&A has been um, talked about a lot, particularly um, with the Trump administration changing the rules in the states. And we're beginning to see um, some activity here. The major one was Dakeda finally managing to acquire Shire after upping its bid five times. And that's um, now got a price tag of $46 billion. Um, we also saw, saw Sanofi outbid Novo Nordisk to buy Adlinks, and the French company it also, it seems to be quite acquisitive at the moment, it's pre previously this year bought by Averitiv as well. So I think this is another area where we just need to keep our eyes open. Great, thanks Alex. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Uh, we just have time for a couple of questions, I think. So just having a look through. So one I picked uh, for you, Alex, sorry oh. to put you straight on the spot. Uh, somebody would like to know whether you think 2018 will be a good year for NASIs or whether uh, 2017 was a blip. Um, gosh, well, I think my sense generally, I think 2017 was, was a vintage year. I'm not sure we're going to see either the number nor the, the high-level novelty that we saw in 2017. I mean, there was quite a few quite a few of the approvals in late 2017 came earlier than expected, so that might have a knock-on effect, but then the same could happen this year, so mm -hmm. it, it's difficult to tell. But one thing, you know, I have highlighted here, there's been quite a few disappointments, so mm -hmm. they might work their way through. So I would be surprised if 2018 is as good as 2017. Okay, so we should prepare for disappointing figures this time <laughs> next year. Well, we'll see. Uh, there have been quite a few questions as well, not surprisingly, I, I guess, are about the, the uh, Takeda Shire tie-up. Mm. And somebody would like to know um, where the, the combined company will appear in, in, the, in the top 10 charts. So I, I took a look at this while Alex was talking. So 
If you recall, Takeda um, was at number nine in the top 10 with 164 drugs. Currently, Shire is down towards the bottom of the top 25 with 67. So if you just add those two numbers up, in purely additive terms, that would give us 231 drugs in the combined pipeline. That would actually uh, catapult the, the, the new entity straight to the top of the charts, beating the current Novartis figure by, by eight drugs. Although, of course, it's worth saying, I think, that um, you know, um, there will be considerable consolidation once the, once the merger occurs. So I expect probably it will be around maybe the number five position when we do our review uh, this time next year. Also worth noting, in, a, you know, in an era where there hasn't been much uh, mega merger activity, uh, what we found in the, some of the big mergers in the, in the early noughties was um, you'd get a company that had 100 drugs merged with a company that had 100 drugs. So the combined entity had 200 drugs, and lo and behold, within the next two or three years, the combined entity had uh, booted out 100 drugs from its pipeline and ended up with the same number of drugs it started with. Mm -hmm. So presumably of better quality, but it, it certainly doesn't necessarily mean that um, these big tie-ups are going to lead to uh, companies with huge pipelines. I'm sure there will be a lot of consolidation once this merger completes. Well, that's if the merger does complete, because that's not a, a done deal yet. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Have to watch that. This is all hypothetical. But okay. it's an interesting question to look at, isn't mm. it? Great. Well, I think we're almost out of time now, so I'd like to wrap up this afternoon's webinar. Just to remind everybody that uh, you will be receiving a, a copy of the slides and a link to a recording of the presentation. And also, if you sent through a question which we didn't manage to get to, we will try to get to you within the next few days and answer your question via email. So all that remains for me to do is to thank my co-presenter, Alex, and to thank everybody online listening. And we hope to talk to you again next year. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.